Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Gordon Current Science and Technology Center. My name is Kareem, and our topic for today's presentation is the future of computing. So to begin, what I'd like you to do is think about all the little ways that computers have found their way into our lives. Think about how many times every day you use one. And I don't just mean using a laptop or desktop at home, school, or work. I mean all those other little ways we use them. Think about your cell phone or your smartphone, using an ATM machine, playing video games, listening to your iPod. Maybe there's a GPS in your car, a DVR in your TV. Even your treadmill at the gym has a computer in it. Now, who would have predicted all of these technologies just 20 or 30 years ago? Those quotes that were circulating at the beginning of the presentation were meant to show you that even experts in the field had a really tough time predicting what the future of computers would hold for us. For example, John von Neumann was one of the very first computer scientists, a brilliant mathematician, and way back in 1949 he made this very bold statement. We have already reached the limits of what it is possible to achieve with computing technology. Now obviously making that kind of statement in 1949, he was proven wrong pretty quickly, but to his credit, he had an inkling that he might be, and he added, one should be careful with such statements, they tend to sound pretty silly in five years. Now we're gonna tackle the very difficult task today of predicting what the future of computers will hold for us. Now you might be laughing at my predictions in five years, but I'll take a shot at it nonetheless. So my presentation is gonna be organized to answer these four questions. The first is, how far have we come? Or in other words, how much have computers changed over the years? The second, can we keep going? Can we continue these trends that we've seen in computing thus far? Where do we go from here? What are the technologies that will take our computing into the future? And finally, what does it mean for us? Risks, benefits, applications, implications. Those are all the things we'll explore today. So starting with that first one, um, how far have we come? This is one of the very first electronic computers. It was called the ENIAC. It was built in Philadelphia in the late 1940s for the US Army. And it was meant to do very complex computations for weapons firing. Now this thing was massive. It took up an enormous room. It weighed more than 30 tons. And it had basically the same computing power as a $1 calculator does today. So in the last few decades, we've been able to take our computers and shrink them down to be really, really small. Now, the ENIAC was incredibly powerful for its time. It was able to do 500 operations every second. Now, compared to one of our supercomputers today, this is the Jaguar, the world's fastest supercomputer. It's at Oak Ridge National Labs. The Jaguar is able to do a quadrillion operations every second. Now that number is so big it's hard to get your, your head around. So 500 for the ENIAC versus a million times a billion for the Jaguar. That's pretty impressive. So in the last few decades we've been obviously able to make our computers a whole lot more capable of complex computations. So another way to think about how far we've come with computing is to look at cell phone technology, which I'm sure you guys are all familiar with. I have one of the uh, cell phones from the 1980s. This was incredible technology back then. Picking up a phone and talking to someone wirelessly, wow, that was a novel concept. Now, a couple decades later, I have an iPhone. Now, first of all, this is a lot smaller and lighter and easier to carry around. I can call my friends, no problem. But what's interesting is the iPhone doesn't just make phone calls. Obviously, it does a lot more. For example, my iPhone also has a camera in it, so I can take some photos. I can even record video with my iPhone. It has a GPS to tell me where I am, where I'm going, and how to get there. Uh, I can play video games on my iPhone. I can, of course, listen to music on my iPhone. And basically, it is like a little miniature computer that I can surf the internet and check my email on. So somehow we've been able to take all of this technology and shrink it down to put it in this tiny little package. And that sums up really nicely the trends that we've seen in computing that show how far we've come. We've been able to take our computers, make them a whole lot smaller, and at the same time we've been able to really advance their capabilities to do many more complex functions. Now, is it reasonable to assume that these trends will continue into the future? Is it possible in a decade, instead of carrying around an iPhone, 
I'll have something with just as much or more capability that basically I can wear that's the size of a button. Or can I have a supercomputer like the Jaguar fit in the palm of my hand? Well, we're starting to realize that there may be some barriers if we want to keep going that way. And if you've ever sat like these people with your tiny, powerful little laptop sitting on your lap, you probably noticed the first of those barriers. And that problem is heat buildup. Have you ever touched electronics when they're running and feel how hot they get? It can be a problem. There have even been medically documented reports of rashes and heat blisters and burns on people's thighs just from having those laptops sit on their laps. Now the injuries themselves are totally beside the point, but they highlight the interesting problem that we have as we shrink electronics and make them more powerful. And that's managing this incredible heat buildup. Now I'm not saying your computer's gonna catch fire anytime soon, but the CPU or the microprocessor in your computer runs about 140 degrees Fahrenheit. And some parts of your computer run as hot as an electric stove, which is why we have things like this. Heat sinks and fans are really important parts of your computer that dissipate that heat and protect the delicate electronics from damage. Now think about this, as we shrink electronics, how are we gonna fit these little cooling devices in, in our shrunken electronics? And if we're making them more powerful, they're generating even more heat. So including these is even more important. We're basically running into this, um, this physical limit that we need to overcome. So you might be wondering, what is it inside a computer that's generating all this heat? And if we look at the heart of our computer, it really is the microprocessor. Now on this tiny little chip of silicon, there are literally millions and billions of tiny electrical switches called transistors. Now that's a really important part of how your computer works and we need to explore that for a moment. A transistor is, the easiest way to think about it is an electrical switch that controls current. When it's off, there's no electricity flowing. When it's on, there is electricity. So it's a simple switch, there's only two states. When it's off, that represents the zero of computing language. When it's on, that represents the one of computing language. And that's basically how our computers store and process information. These transistors turn off and on very quickly, representing the ones and zeros of computing language, processing and storing all of our data as bytes. They take your complex information, like your movies, your videos, your pictures, and they store them as the smallest pieces of information possible, and each small piece of information is represented by eight ones and zeros and stored as one byte of data. Now, obviously, to do the very complex things our computers do, we need to have millions and billions of transistors turning off and on very quickly to process all these ones and zeros. Now, what that means is every single one of these, these microprocessors has billions of little electrical switches. Now they've gotta be tiny if we're gonna fit two billion of anything on that tiny square. Um, I have a microprocessor right here, and this is actually the plastic casing for one. The actual chip of silicon itself is much smaller inside. Now a transistor I mentioned is small. It's a nanoscale device. It's in the range of 30 to 40 nanometers wide. Now that's such a small measurement. Again, it's something that's hard to get our brains around. So to give you some perspective, if I took one human hair, the width of that human hair is 100,000 nanometers. So each transistor is many thousand times smaller than the width of a single human hair. Now they haven't always been this small. The first transistor built in 1947 was about a half inch tall, this kind of mangled up piece of wire. And in the 50s, we shrunk them down, put them on silicon chips. This is the first integrated circuit, and that just changed the game for electronics. And since then, we've kept shrinking transistors, putting more and more transistors on our computer chips. And every two years, we've doubled the number of transistors that we can fit on these chips. And that's a trend you may have heard of as Moore's Law. And that is the key to advancing our computing. The more transistors we have on our chips, the more data can be stored and processed by our computers.